Welcome, everyone, to this special edition of the Doorstep Podcast, a two-part episode that we did at MSU Denver as part of our outreach and traveling, taking the doorstep to the road. I'm your co-host, Senior Fellow at the Carnegie Council, Nick Vozdev. And I'm Tatiana Serafin, also Senior Fellow here at Carnegie. So excited about our fall doorstep podcast series that literally takes us to the doorstep of campuses around the country. Uh, at MSU Denver, we were so excited to meet uh, many students that expressed some of their concerns and issues around foreign policy and how it impacts their day-to-day -day life. We are going to speak to them and to some wonderful speakers uh, today. Um, in the first part of our session, we met with uh, Janine Davidson, the president of MSU, to talk about diversity in foreign policy making and foreign policy outreach. And in the second part of our conversation, we were joined by Deepak Das, Robert Prius and Stephanie Santos, professors looking at various aspects of the role that diversity plays in foreign policy making. Uh, we can't wait to share this with you and we look forward to your feedback. Hi everybody, I'm Janine Davidson and I'm the president of MSU Denver. I'm really delighted to have you all here today. How many uh, Roadrunners are in the house? Okay, and how many, what, Pioneer? Are you guys still the DU folks, okay? All right, well. Um, welcome again. This is the, the Doorstep podcast, which I was listening to just this morning, actually. Um, the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs, and we are so fortunate to have with us uh, Nick Gvostev. Gvostev. Nick Gvostev and Tatiana Serafin. They're the co hosts of this podcast. Um, Dean Fritz Mayer from the Corbell School at DU was going to be here, but he has COVID. COVID. So I get to stand in for him and I'm super excited about that. So, and I also apologize that you don't get to see Fritz and you're stuck with me, but um, I think we're going to have a really good conversation. Um, a little bit about MSU Denver for those of you listening and also for those of you in the house. We are the proud third largest university in the state of Colorado. Um, we have about 17,000 students here. We're the largest Hispanic serving institution in the state. Uh, we play a really special role when it comes to diversity. 55% of our students are uh, students of color, and 60% of our students are first in their family generation to go to college, which is a mission that we take very seriously and we're super proud of, actually. And so our role, really, I see it as really preparing Colorado's workforce and civil society for the future, which as I think we'll probably discuss a little bit today, is only gonna get more complex, uh, more global, um, and require a lot more ability of the next generation to be able to solve complex problems in service to society and the world. No pressure, but you can do it. <laughs> A little bit about my background. Yes, I'm the president here, but I have also a foreign policy and a national security background. I used to work in the Pentagon. I'm current, I currently serve as the chair for the Defense Policy Board, which is the board that advises the Secretary of Defense um, in the Pentagon. And I'm also on the board that advises the Secretary of State. And so it's very interesting in that role because most of the people on those boards come from the coasts, as we say here in Colorado, M many of them, most of them in the Washington DC or New York area. And so there's a couple of us that talk about, you know, here we're coming out from the flyover states. And it's really important that the folks in Washington that are making these decisions have our perspectives. And so that's why I love having these kinds of events because I do think that that's super important. And especially with the conversation today about and the work that you all do with Carnegie, which is really about diversifying the voices. Uh, that go into that decision making, which is something I'm very passionate about. At MSU Denver, we have a growing, starting uh, Institute for Public Policy. And a big part of that, we have our lead here, Sean LeBaire. Um, one of the big parts of that is that we want to start sending students to Washington, D.C. in the summer about three or four of them every year to get that perspective for them. A lot of our students have never even been out of Colorado. I mean, and um, but also so the the lawmakers and policymakers in Washington can hear from us because uh, our voices are super important. Um, and this is where I'm also going to put a plug in for the humanities, right? And I think you guys talk about this a lot on your podcast, either in some way or another. But, you know, there's a lot of emphasis in higher education and education in general for STEM, <clears throat> which I'm a huge fan of. Um, we have a really robust cybersecurity program and engineering programs and everything else. 
But when we talk about the problems that are plaguing the planet, whether it's climate change, pandemics, war, um, income inequality, um, economic disruptions, it's not usually the math and the science that we're getting wrong as a society. It's all the other stuff. It's the interpersonal stuff. It's the having a sense of history and understanding how to solve these problems. And that's what, another reason why I'm really proud of the students that are in this room today and that you take an interest in these issues because that's what's really gonna help us move into or solve these problems um, on a global scale. Diversity, 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 super critical to have those voices and have those um, opinions reflected in society. Um, so that's why I'm excited to partner with you all on this. Um, and speaking of partnerships, the other reason we're here today is to really talk about the partnership that MSU Denver has been developing with the Corbell School, which I'm super proud of. And I'm sad that Fritz isn't here today because a lot of this, I think, was his idea or you guys co-created it with Rob um, in our uh, School of Political Science. But it's pretty exciting that um, Corbell Graduate School of International Affairs, is that what it's called? Graduate School of what? Studies. Graduate, study, uh, graduate School of International Studies. Um, it's really one of the top schools in the nation for in the graduate area. And what we've done is said that our students who graduate from our program will be, have sort of preferred admissions into that program and a cut rate on tuition. Am I right? 50% off, that's a pretty big deal. And they're also working on um, articulation agreements so that some of the credits and courses that you take here can transfer in, am I right? Okay, so did I get all that right? That's a pretty big deal, and I'm really, really proud of the work that you all have done to set that up. And I really hope some of these students take advantage of it because it's, it's a world-class program, and we're really excited to partner with you guys. So, um, Rob, our Dean Mayor was supposed to explain all that, so I'm glad I got that right. And I guess now we are gonna move into our program. Yeah? Program. All right. Well, thank you much. Thank you very much, Janine. We really appreciate the invitation to come here. And uh, just to let people know about how, as you noted, this foreign policy community establishes connections over time. We've known each other now for uh, at least uh, 15 years or so, a decade or more. Um, and very modest uh, description of your biography, so I hope I don't embarrass you uh, by noting that one of the most critical posts you held was as Under Secretary of the Navy. Uh, and you came up to Newport to the Naval War College in 2016, and you gave an address, uh, one that I actually still show clips of in my seminars, because you saw where things were going. And in your address, you said to the assembled students, and this was at a time when we thought peace and prosperity, everything's going wonderfully, and you said we had to be aware, and you said to the audience, a pandemic is coming. It's 2016. Pandemic is coming. We have supply chain vulnerabilities. We have the potential for an energy shock. And that sooner or later, Russia was going to make some pretty aggressive moves, and China as well. And we look where we are in 2023, um, and perhaps not, you didn't want any of this to come true, but it did. But there's a sense that you were seeing this, some others were, but that for the most part, the American foreign policy establishment assumed smooth sailing ahead. And this is why I wanted to tie it back with what you were saying about perspectives, diverse voices, uh, people coming in from not only just differing groups, but even from different locales in the country. What is it that you see about that encouraging that diversity that may help the United States achieve better foreign policy and national security outcomes? Um, well, Thank you. And actually, I did not introduce like your backgrounds either. And I don't have your. So I've, I've, can we pause for a second so you can introduce and give a little bit of overview of where you're coming from as well? Because I know you're Car Carnegie, but. Hi. Oh. Hello. Yeah. Hello? I, it's yeah. ambient, so you should be able Here to go. Yeah. Um, I met some of you in class today, so so excuse the repetition, but for those of you who are here, uh, welcome. First of all, welcome from, from Carnegie. Um, I'm Tatiana Serafin, Senior Fellow at Carnegie. I am uh, also co-host with Nick of the podcast, The Doorstep, which we're taping today with you all. Uh, thank you for participating. Um, I also teach journalism, so my perspective on, on foreign policy is how we communicate. 
And I think communication is important. Words matter. Words matter. And so that is uh, where I come from when we are talking about anything, when we're even talking about diversity. <laughs> what does that mean? That is probably the most overused term in 20. 23 ever, but what does it mean? And, and what are we really doing about it? Um, words matter. And, um, uh, I am so excited to be here with you to get outside the bubble that Janine was talking about. Um, because there is this sort of East coast, West coast, you know, Oh, we're the center of the universe, but, uh, no, we're not. And, uh, you know, we are traveling now around the country. Uh, we were in Texas a few weeks ago. We're here with you. We'll be up to Ohio. We hope to do more in the spring to really understand you and your voice because words matter. So thank you for participating today. And if you are interested in journalism, and I hope all of you are, um, please see me afterwards where I think we're going to have a reception together. No, and, uh, I think uh, Janine knows me, but for those who don't, so primarily you know, I'm here in my hat as uh, Carnegie uh, Council for Ethics and International Affairs. Uh, I also happen to edit a foreign policy journal called Orbis of which Janine is uh, on the board, uh, and which MSU Denver did a special issue with us, uh, which Rob and other of his uh, um, uh, counterparts and, and uh, colleagues contributed to, including something that got this conversation started, uh, which was uh, the work on, wait a minute, does it matter? Do, do different Americans from different ethnic, class, geographic backgrounds actually have different perspectives on what U.S. interests are, what they ought to be, how the U.S. ought to be engaged in the world. So this is a case where one of my affiliations, the Orbis affiliation, created the idea, which now we're doing with the, uh, with the Carnegie Corporation, uh, uh, sorry, with the uh, Carnegie Council, with the support of the Carnegie Corporation, uh, to come out and have these conversations. Because one of the things, and, and coming back, uh, you know, would we have a different approach if the U.S. national security establishment looked more like America, and if the U.S. national security establishment was based in Denver or Austin or San Jose as opposed to, to Washington. And it, since we can't relocate the federal government, is there an argument then for ensuring that these pipelines exist? Because as much as we talk about diversity, and we've had uh, one on our podcast earlier, Ambassador Charles Ray, uh, very who's worked on these initiatives to try to get the State Department to look more like America, and yet it often still looks like what they call hype, Harvard, Yale, Princeton. Uh, nothing wrong with any of those fine institutions, uh, but do people from those institutions miss things that, again, Janine, you saw trends that were happening, whereas a lot of people were very confident that we were we were headed towards smooth sailing into the 2020s. Well, maybe the maybe the Naval War College thought we were heading towards smooth sailing uh, in that particular time, but there were a lot of people talking about these issues, but I think you're absolutely right that... Um, you got lots of people all over the country with different perspectives. And I think a big one on the diversity front, what we can drop anchor on, as we'd like to say in the Navy, would be um, like immigration, where I do think that, you know, the different uh, ethnic makeup of uh, America really has people with different perspectives on that. But when it comes to things like climate change or the China threat or the Russia threat, it was very interesting in 2016 because I was seeing the Russia threat very clearly. And there were a few of us that, that were... Um, it was a sense of history, right? A lot of people, um, I think, in Europe have forgotten what big major uh, power war is like because uh, since World War II, it's been uh, pretty calm on the European continent. And the idea that somebody would be that aggressive and do that kind of thing, it's sort of like, nah, that wouldn't make any sense, you know? But let me just say the history is filled with things that don't make sense because people do a lot of very stupid things. And that's why historians know this, right? And you bring those perspectives in. And I would say also, um, folks that I know that are part of the Russia diaspora in America, they knew. People that were um, like from the Baltics, um, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, people from Poland, people from Georgia that I had met in my travels and that we know people in America that are from those parts of the country, they knew. And so you're right. How did we get those voices in there? You know, that I would say that. Um, 
I think if we found ways to have more of those conversations, that stuff might might come to light a little bit more. The other piece of it is is that the the military in particular, the national security apparatus, they get they get a little like those kids on a soccer field, you know, when they all come around that one ball, right? And uh, what was the one ball back then? It was China, and they weren't looking at Russia, and the other parts were looking at the Middle East. And now they're all looking at China again. And so you can watch them try to say, oh, we need to get out of Russia, but or out of the out of Ukraine and out of that 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 um, conflict. But um, anyway, the point is, it goes both ways. So yes, we need those voices in the room. Um, but then the other thing that happens is there is expertise. Don't discount the expertise that is in that apparatus, right? That are seeing things, um, especially like economics. And I think a lot of Americans were really surprised during the pandemic that the supply chain affected their day-to-day -day lives. Now, there's plenty of people in Washington that gamed out the pandemic and knew that that would happen. But why didn't that information get to the American people? The American people really don't have a sense of why what's happening on the time on straits and in the South China Sea matters to them. And it and we tell you that it does. We can have a whole other conversation about that if you want to. But if and when that kicks off, the American people need to support whatever happens in order to reestablish security in that region. And I know you talk a lot about soft power, but in that particular situation, soft power and hard power are very interrelated. So and so building on that, and, and really, as you're saying, really, the, it's the genesis of the whole doorstep concept, right? That, hey, what happens somewhere else actually impacts you in your own life, your family's life, your local community, businesses, uh, so on and so forth. When you're talking about pipelines, bringing people in, what do you see as the challenges for a D.C.-based to some extent, New York-based yeah. community accepting these voices and saying a voice that comes from MSU Denver and a perspective of someone who is first-generation immigrant background that says, look, we have a perspective on the I-35 corridor from running from Canada to Mexico, trade, climate, water issues, that this needs to be brought in and not just in a kind of box checking exercise, but really the idea of, you know, national security is human security, economic security, health security. How do you how do you ensure that an MSU Denver voice will be given the same respect, yeah. if, for lack of a better word, than someone saying, well, as Tatiana and I are both alums of Georgetown School of Foreign Service, we have a to the manner born, right? Of of course we have a perspective on foreign affairs because we're here. But how do you say, hey, the MSU Denver voice uh, should be right there next to the the SFS voice, Georgetown SFS? Well, thank you. Um, we do things like this. We partner with great people like you. Um, we open the door to our students to get to Washington. Um, and when they get there, they seal the deal because our students are amazing. And they do. They seal the deal. And people say, oh, I hadn't thought about that. Um, and every little thing matters. And I'll tell you, we're at a really, um, I think, fortunate time, believe it or not. Um, for whatever reason, this particular administration came in with this mindset, by the way. So Jake Sullivan, who's the national security advisor, Salman Ahmed, who's the um, P <laughs> policy uh, planning person at the State Department working for um, Anthony Blinken. When they, during the Trump administration, they were out in the think tanky world and they did something similar to what you're doing now. Um, well, they just had the question like, how do we make Americans aware of foreign policy? How do we make foreign policy relevant to Americans? They really thought about that. Um, I don't know that they came up with exactly the right or all the answers, but they brought that, at least that open mindedness back into the um, in, back into Washington. And so when I go to the State Department three times a year and we have these meetings with the secretary, they're very open to it. And they're like, we just really want to diversify our foreign service. We know it's important. We want to get out there. So like I did, they didn't even know what an HSI was. 
Now they do. <laughs> We've had them here on campus. Now they're aware. We've started the pipeline. I mean, and it's just this one campus, but it's a super important campus because it is smack in the middle of the country and it's uber diverse and it's, you know, we've got increasing uh, connectivity to, to the global community with our economy and our airport and things like that. And so, you know, it's little by little and then you have these big breakthroughs. So I'm hoping for a big breakthrough, but I think it's gonna be generational. Um, I wanted to um, kind of go off on the your supply chain. We They knew. But the word, di word didn't get out. And so we talked in, in the classes, and I'm, I want to tell you, your students are super news literate. Well, I'm very impressed um, with their uh, breadth and depth of, of consuming news and challenging the news and thinking about the news. Um, but what do you think the, you know, the media, right? And, and, and I don't like using terms like the media, or the, but... but in general, you know, can what can we do better to, to cover these kinds of issues or to make the connection? So just as you're making the connection between the university and, you know, to high levels, what can the media do better to make those connections to make sure that that story was out there? Because, you know, in, so, in some of the classes we heard, well, foreign policy is the federal government. And we're here to say, no, foreign policy is the state and local government. No, it's, that's really true. I think that um, sort of good news, bad news, there's so much information out there that it's sort of overwhelming. And, you know, when our grandparents got up in the morning and they read, they read the, the local paper, you know, and if they lived in a major metropolis like New York, L.A., Washington, D.C., Chicago, that daily newspaper was also very globally focused in a lot of ways. That's how I grew up, either in the California area or the Washington, D.C. area. And now there's just the news is everywhere. And there's a lot of misinformation as well. Um, I think the, if you want to call the mainstream media, the TV media, it's not really media anymore. It's really just, um, it's a lot of opinion. And so I think it comes more down to education. I mean, the 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 information's out there. Um, the, the major news outs, outlets, the think tanks have fantastic information. Um, it's, it's helping students, especially young students in high school and whatever, understand or figure out the difference between what's legit, what's not legit. Um, but on the supply chain and things like that. I think you have to go top down and bottom up. So, you know, it's the business leaders need to understand this, right? I mean, they're the ones working these supply chains. They're watching right now the tensions in China and they're already making moves. I think 10 years ago they might not have, right? But then they saw what happened uh, in Ukraine where you had this big ripple with, with grain and oil and energy. And then you saw, again, the pandemic. It was a wake-up call. So um, really trying to, when that happens, so to short answer your question, I always say people don't eat till they're hungry, and then they eat everything in sight. So nobody, I mean, people that are very smart people in the Denver area that run businesses and have their heads down and taking care of their family, highly educated, probably couldn't find Ukraine on a map until it happened. And then they were passionately like, what is happening? And then we had events, and then we had articles, and I was on TV, and like that kind of thing. So when the event happens, you got to be first with the context, not just with the perspective, like, not just with the event, and not just with um, the opinion, you know? Because that's when people, I think, are going to really want it. So that that's what I would do. Thank you very much for this uh, conversation and uh, for what you've uh, said and the confidence that uh, this pipeline is working and we'll hope to be back to continue the dialogue with you. Thank you very much. So one day Roadrunners will be running the world. <laughs> We've just finished uh, a wonderful conversation with uh, Janine Davidson and it really gets us thinking about how a U.S. foreign policy establishment that looks more like America might have better outcomes for U.S. global engagement. And we're going to transition now to the second part of our special podcast from the campus of MSU Denver, where we're going to look at how 
different doorsteps, depending on what doorstep you're at, may lead you to different perspectives and priorities as to what you think the United States ought to be doing in the world. And I think our speakers really represent some great viewpoints. Uh, Professor Das takes us through viewpoints from the global south and what foreign policy looks like globally, not just from a U.S. perspective. Um, Professor Santos delves into gender inequity uh, and other issues that we need to be looking at when we're looking at different approaches to foreign policy, such as feminist foreign policy. Um, and Professor Prius takes us through what issues he found in his research uh, and in his Orbis piece that led to our discussion here at MSU Denver today. Uh, we also want to thank uh, the uh, Joseph Corbell School of International Studies uh, at the University of Denver um, for their guest speakers. Uh, and we look forward to your comments from this section of our podcast as well. Thank you all again. This is, is phase two or discussion two of our event today. And I appreciate, of course, your attendance. Um, and as you know, Nick was mentioning, we, you know, this emerged from some, some work we've done and some of my uh, Dr. Dr. Ruski is here, myself and Dr. Makeley were co-editors of this Orbis journal that has you know, kind of led to fruition in terms of these types of questions. So today we are going to talk about what for policy discussions often don't talk about, at least that's our theme here, you know, and in particular a focus on diversity within uh, the United States, as we've talked to, as Janine Dr. Davidson has <laughs> talked about uh, earlier, um, but also different perspectives from across the world, with a particular focus on the global south. Um, so I'm joined here as, as, as a brief introduction for myself. I'm Robert Preuss. I'm chair and professor of political science here at Metropolitan State University. Most of my research focuses on domestic politics. I'm a little out of my element, but where I center that uh, research is really in differences across racial and ethnic groups. Groups, uh, with focuses on preferences, but also with focuses on how those preferences emerge uh, and are uh, listened to, right, and reflected by legislative institutions. Um, to my right uh, is Dr. Stephanie Santos. Uh, she is an assistant professor of gender, women's and, gender women and sexualities uh, here at Metropolitan State University. Uh, and her research really looks at labor flows, particularly in Southeast um, Asia. In Thailand, and she's going to talk a bit about you know, what that looks like when we're starting to think about formula, formulating policies outside of you know, a much more traditional kind of perspective. Uh, and then to her right is Dr. Deepak Das, who is an assistant professor at the Corbell School of International Studies. Uh, his focus is on South Asia, and he does a lot of national security, particularly uh, issues with nuclear agreements uh, and disagreements, right, uh, across uh, countries in that sphere. So we're really happy to have you, and I'll turn it maybe over to our guest or our host. Would you like us to start? All right, yeah. Well, thank you all uh, for joining us uh, for this uh, special edition of the uh, of the Doorstep podcast, uh, and really to to bring at this question, I, I, I want to maybe as an overarching question uh, put this forward, which is um, both the the composition, but also then the perspectives that come from having diversity within the foreign policy national security establishment, if it looks more like America, what changes might you expect in how the U.S. engages in the world? Uh, would we see more of a north-south engagement? Because traditionally, the U.S. has conceived of itself in horizontal terms. We think across the Atlantic, across the Pacific. We don't think in terms of north-south as much. Um, just as one point that uh, as as may, and maybe where this is changing is that during the UN General Assembly on the sidelines uh, President Biden announces this new Atlantic compact this Atlantic pact which for the first time says the South Atlantic matters as much as the North Atlantic and we want countries like Brazil or Nigeria or Morocco to be just as part of an Atlantic community whereas before we always said Atlantic community really meant Euro Atlantic not the Atlantic as a whole so is there a sense that shifts in how we staff how we organize what issues rise to the fore would lead to a change in how the US positions itself globally 
Sure. And, and so I'm going to start out actually in addressing that question by taking a look at public preferences here within the United States across racial and ethnic groups. And what we find is that there actually is a difference. We are defined, of course, uh, in our current political system as highly polarized. And we think in terms of Democratic and Republican affinities and policy orientations. Uh, but you know, digging under the surface, and this is something that we often do miss, uh, is some real variation in terms of public policy preferences within each of the parties, and particularly within the party that is the most representative uh, in terms of diversity. Uh, and that's the Democratic Party here. Um, we really can think of Republicans as ideologically uh, oriented Republicans but also then group interest Democrats with a large coalition with fairly different uh, pre preferences. You know, not, not completely diverging, but certainly different. Um, and that does that is going to become more important. And we actually, as it struck me, also MSU Denver has a connection in the Southern Command as the, their new leader or their new commander is uh, MSU Denver alumni as well, General, General Richardson. Um, so let me let me start. Um, I'm gonna. I know we're looking forward to the camera, but we'll try to say. So you know, where are these different differences across racial and ethnic groups within the United States. And I want to start by just kind of pointing out that within the parties, there's a pretty broad difference. Uh, the public opinion on foreign policy and support for different policy preferences on that had traditionally stopped right at the border, at the, at the water's edge. And we were in agreement. New narratives are arising and we now have polarization certainly affecting to a greater extent foreign policy preferences than it has before. Those preferences aren't immune anymore to partisan and partisan affect. Um, but within these groups, we actually tend to see both, or within the coalition, particularly the Democratic coalition, we tend to see a more moderating effect. Uh, and this is across a number of policies, right? So this is just a quick shot of some of the overall my top lines for levels of support uh, to authorize additional funding for support you know, to, to support Ukraine in the war with Russia. And this is recent data, 2023. Um, keep in mind, Democrats uh, and Republicans certainly differ uh, by quite a bit. Uh, but once you start to break down that co those coalition memberships and primarily African-Americans within the Democratic Party and to a lesser extent, but still fairly strong Democrats within the Latino, uh, within the Latino community, um, really look an awful lot more like any Independence and an awful lot and a little bit closer to uh, Republicans than their white white counterparts. Um, another issue is climate action, right? And certainly within the climate action community, there's some variation. Um, but you know, if we take a look at white non-Hispanics versus black non-Hispanics versus uh, Hispanics, um, what you tend to see is the most support among whites for you know strong climate action as a trade with a trade-off in terms of cost. So these are types of policies that really you know kind of open up this potential for different and diverse and different and differing right, policy perspectives, but it also opens up the potential for coalition memberships um, that may be outside of this polarized partisanship. And I think that's something we can talk about a little bit more as well. Um, Finally, and this is just some research that I'd done a few years ago. This is actually from our Orbis piece that we, that we published a couple of years ago. If you look at the really broad spectrum of policies, and this is just a snapshot from about 2018 and 2019 data, and this is just uh, Democrats, um, you can see that for the most part, when we take a look at the Democratic Party, the members of those coalitions, those communities differ. Uh, and these differ significantly, even after we've controlled for a whole slew of usual independent uh, effects or independent uh, variables. So we're seeing these differences. We're seeing an opening uh, among uh, Latinos and African Americans in particular uh, for some coalition building that could help produce you know, a new narrative, uh, which is essentially something that's lacking right now uh, and seems focused primarily right on this Republican-Democrat divide, uh, which is, of course, you know, influencing even more uh, some of our politics um, and division. So I'm going to stop there. We'll, we'll move on. All right. So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being um, part of this activity um, on our campus today. So my name is Dr. Stephanie Santos, and I'm an interdisciplinary scholar. And I use humanistic because of our discussion earlier about the humanities, right? So I use humanistic and qualitative um, 
research methods to study uh, how labor and capital flows from Southeast Asia to the global north and vice versa. And so my work is very much influenced. So in terms of thinking about new narratives um, of, of foreign policy and international relations, maybe I, I, I'll put forward um, a, a new old narrative, right? So my own work is very much influenced by feminist international relations theorists, including Cynthia Emlow, who advocates for um, a grassroots approach towards thinking about international relations, right? So what does it mean to do international relations as if vulnerable people's lives mattered? Um, I also build on Chandra Mohanty's studies of globalization, um, particularly her invitation to think about globalization not as a process or processes that happen over there, right? But but as, as something that was being discussed earlier that's about um, state policy, that's about local city policies as processes that happen in the United States, in Colorado, and right here in Denver. So um, in the first, oh, actually I forgot to, okay, I'm moving the wrong one, okay, so. So in the first half of this year, I was conducting field work with digital workers in Southeast Asia, just in time for the explosion of interest um, about uh, into processes of artificial intelligence, right? Most of the dominant media accounts, constructions, um, however, frame this issue around the supposed existential threats of an unchecked and super powerful artificial intelligence. This framework, of course, reflects what AI scholar Timnit Gebru has called the boys club culture that's resulting from the lack of diversity in high tech. So in keeping with Cynthia Enlow's invitation, um, I spent the full right semester thinking about artificial intelligence from the situated knowledge of digital workers in Southeast Asia. So what do we learn about artificial intelligence if our starting point was not Silicon Valley, right, but instead the digital sweatshops where, where the vulnerable people who do the labors behind artificial intelligence live and labor? What, do we, what we find then is that a lot of um, artificial intelligence is actually a lot of very intense and devalued labor right? that is rendered as invisible, as machinic, as part of automated processes of code. So I, I interviewed content moderators, for example, who were charged with clearing social media, right? cleaning social media of, of violent imagery. And it's a, it's a job that subjected the workers to a steady stream of, of gore and, and um, traumatic images, right? The best steady stream of violence and gore. I spoke with the people who use Game Boy controllers to remotely drive food delivery robots around Toronto and Los Angeles. And this is a job that requires people to work in close proximity to one another in unventilated spaces, all to enable the contactless food delivery that keeps us here in the global north safe. And, and a lot of the constructions of, of keeping the world safe, for example, in keeping with our discussion about how words matter, how journalistic accounts matter. Um, these are framed as how AI, how, in, uh, um, how machinery, how technology is keeping us safe. And it's not AI and machinery, but people in the Philippines, in Indonesia, in Thailand, in India, who are doing this labor. Um, and I also spoke with, with um, freelance workers who are tasked with um, labeling pediatric crossings, lay, um, I'm sorry, pedestrian crossings, excuse me, lanes and curbs in order to train algorithms for driverless cars. So again, this is work that is done by people and workers. And so part then, so building on, on feminist principles of international relations, um, this is an invitation that if we center the people who are doing this work, the threats of international, of, of artificial intelligence is much less like a powerful rogue Skynet, for example. The threats are, are things that are along this, um, uh, along a much longer genealogy, right, of, of thinking about labor, for example, labor relations, and also thinking about environment, um, environment and so-called clean energies, right? If we center their experiences, um, we can think about, for example, how the, the labor, the conditions under which people um, who do the work of artificial, artificial intelligence labor, right? So the, their working conditions um, mirror and are exported from, from similar working conditions here in the United States. So what does it mean to think about, about 
laboring conditions, um, working conditions of, of, of devalued workers in the US and in, in places like Thailand, India, and the Philippines as something that can be in solidarity with one another instead of oppositional interests. Similarly with environment, a lot of these so-called clean technologies, for example, are very destructive to environments. Um, cobalt mining, for example, is very destructive and it involves child labor. Um, the, the brining of, of uh, batteries, lithium batteries, is destructive to, to rivers from Indonesia to Chile, for example. So, so what does it mean to think about international relations and foreign policy as something, as a bridge, for example, or as, as shared interests from which we can continue to act and think in solidarity. So that's an invitation that I, I would like to extend and I hope it's something that we can continue talking about. Right. Thank you, Salamat. Thanks. Um, Hi everyone, uh, my name is uh, Debak Das. I'm an assistant professor at the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies at the University of Denver. So first of all, I'd like to thank Nick, Tatiana, and especially Rob for organizing this, for being here, giving us this opportunity to actually speak to everyone over here. So to answer somewhat indirectly Nick's question, uh, for the last couple of years, as the Russian invasion of Ukraine has gone on, I've thought of a number of things. My primary work is in the world of nuclear security. Um, so, of course, the question of the use of nuclear weapons and Ukraine has been very high on the agenda in terms of scholar, my scholarly work. But the other thing that's also been important in terms of thinking about is this role of the global south uh, and Ukraine. Uh, and you know, as soon as the conflict started in March, there was a vote in the UN. And soon after, the questions that kept getting asked was, what's going on with the global south? Why don't they support the US on this war? Uh, why aren't they actually voting with the U.S. or with the West in condemning Russia? And as it turns out, it, it's, it's more complicated than just supporting the U.S., right? Uh, and so if you look at some of the, the votes over here, the number of countries that actually abstained was fairly high. The number of vo votes against Russia fairly high as well. But why are all those countries abstaining? In particular, if you look at Africa, for example, right, uh, the number of abstentions which are in the purple is fairly high. Um, and what's interesting here is that we need to think about these things in terms of nuance, in terms of what are the historical experiences of these countries? What are the socioeconomic index indicators in these countries? Who are these countries trading with? And more importantly, what are the geopolitical contexts that these country, countries are operating under, right? So recently, there's been a lot of talk about BRICS and this, this concern that there's this alternative world order that's being created by these countries with Putin in the middle, and then you've got India and China sort of leading the pack with South Africa and Brazil being a part of this. And, you know, the, the thing is, well, yes, this is a grouping, but it's one of many different multilateral groupings in the world. The United States, as well as other Western powers, have stakes in some other groupings. I'm thinking of groupings like the Quad, which operates in the Indo-Pacific against China. And the more important thing to note here is that the Global South is not one unified entity at all, right? India and China are bickering on the borders. There are soldiers who are fighting each other, not with guns, but with sticks, with nails, uh, and uh, uh, things like that uh, tied around them. So, so there, those are two countries with a billion people each and some uh, fighting each other. Uh, India does not necessarily get along very well with South Africa, given recent foreign policy relationships. Uh, and so there's all sorts of other things happening within the world of the global south. So which is to say, it's not all bad news. Um, if you look at the map below over here, those are votes uh, that happened in the UN after the Russian annexation of Crimea. And if you look at that, compared to what the votes were in, on March 2nd of 2022, there are more countries which are voting with the West against Russia, against this territorial infringement, against the war, if you will, uh, than there were in 2014. So the trend line there is upward, 
But at the same time, there are a considerable number of countries which are not, in fact, voting against Russia. And, you know, India and China, of course, stand out over there. And they make up for a large part of that by aggregate population statistic, uh, which has been put out by the Peterson Institute. Uh, and so... One thing that we as scholars of international relations uh, have to be thinking about, and I encourage all of you who are following the news to think about, is why is it that these countries aren't actually voting with the United States? Uh, it's the United States, as well as especially DC, often falls into this trap of thinking of everything in terms of US national interest, right? It's in our national interest. This is morally correct. Why won't you vote with us? And so, the, the, the call is to step back from that position, to think about the national interest of all these other states. Why might they be voting with you? What are the overlapping areas of concern that you have with the United States? Or if you're the United States, what are the overlapping areas of concern that you have with these other countries, right? So what are the geopolitical particularities? What are the economic and social inequalities that these countries are facing? And more importantly, what are the historical intervention and historical experiences of these countries with the West? How might you start start addressing those? How might you put some of those worries aside, start placating them, or working together with them? So with that, with those opening remarks, I'll hand it back to our hosts. Thank you so much. Um, I uh, Words matter, remember what I said. And oh, I'm curious, because all of you kind of mentioned this nexus of power moving from Silicon Valley, from the global north, you know, from DC. So, uh, you know, with this change, right, or, you know, perceived change, that's going to change the way the world perceives the U.S. In classes today, I asked, what do you expect from the government? What do you think, you know, in, in your various areas of study, have you seen that the world expects from the U.S. that maybe the U.S. isn't getting because we're always thinking about our national interest? Anyone? Well, you know, and I can start, but but from the U.S. perspective, you know, I think this the diversity in those preferences really highlights some of the considerations, particularly in humanitarian issues. But this real balance, not just of uh, economic opportunity and economic interest, which is still apparent across all groups, by the way, um, but also with that more you know humanitarian, democratic kind of balance. Um, how do we balance those two elements? So, for instance, you know, we can pull out a, a spike uh, among Latinos in terms of favorability for intervention uh, post-2008 Venezuelan um, uh, uh, election crisis. Um, we can pull out traditionally histor historic support for, uh, you know, represented both among individuals, but also among uh, elected officials. And this is why it's so important to get that that pipeline going um, for support for for Haiti, right? For references to why we're not going into places in uh, Africa that are, you know, equally troubling to various constituencies as, say, Ukraine. And so, you know, I think as we diversify and as we try to pull those, you know, kind of elements in, um, recognizing that those points can be part of the narrative and the discussion and the dialogue of foreign policy, partly because we as, as Americans are so diverse and have some of these different issues. I think, and, and in terms, in building upon what you were saying in terms of like diversifying, um, diversifying the, the, the pipeline, diversifying people who have direct effect or access to institutions of foreign affairs, you make me think too of like, you know, Thinking about where we are, the population of the students um, who who are with us in this university. So many of us are are um, have complicated notions of what it means to be American and and relationships to the term home, right? So even thinking about what are in my interest as an American, and then as somebody who is who is from the global south, somebody who is of Southeast Asian descent, they're not necessarily things that I, I can parse out and separate. So, so I think part of my my invitation and and hope as as more roadrunners, as more as more um, um, people, right, from from institutions like MSIs and HSIs, um, get into to foreign policy work is is to rethink maybe this dichotomy, right? So what does it mean to think about 
overlapping interests or my, um, especially in terms of like environment, for example, I, I cannot tell you where my, my own interests as, as a resident, um, who has strong family ties and also strong personal and political, um, ties to, to people in the global South to Southeast Asia and, and separate that from, from thinking about rights and duties and, and expectations here in the United States. I also think that for, for, um, people in the global south, at least the populations who I, I was working with, so vulnerable workers who don't have access, for example, to, to institutions of redress, right? The same way um, when, when Facebook, for example, um, when Facebook was sued by their US-based content moderators, they had to acknowledge the trauma that was inherent in the labor and pay damages to to their US-based workers. But those damages did not extend or apply to workers in the global south, right? So, so thinking too about like how we can think about damages, how we can think about reparations, how we can think about protections, um, um, and as how they extend to workers and residents whose, whose labor, whose loss of land, for example, whose displacement from their homes um, are very much um, um, related, right? So are very much, um, uh, interrelated to to our work and um, our digital and and our digital lives here in the global north. Thanks. Uh, so I think what what uh, other countries are looking for from the United States are twofold: one, stability, and two is following through on your commitments. Right. Uh, I'm thinking in particular of two examples. The first example is Afghanistan. Right. It's all good to say, you know, like the United States stood up for Ukraine and did the right thing. That's true. But six months before that, we saw what happened in Afghanistan. And if you look at the reports of where women in Afghanistan are today, what the state of many of the institutions in the United States was building in earnest and in good faith, the state of those institutions today, that's that's all crumbled. Right. So what does it mean to be in a war for 20 years and then, you know, in a span, in a short span of two years and really on the ground one fine day say, yeah, we're out. Right. Likewise, the second example I'm thinking about is the JCPOA. Right, which by all accounts was a great deal. You had the Iranian program capped at 3.67% uh, of uranium enrichment. The United States turns around and gets out of the agreement. Right, so these aren't necessarily stable actions of a state that claims to have a important leadership role in the global community. Now, of course, these are certain particular incidents that had to do with a particular term, presidential term in the United States. But at the same time, if you're the world looking at what's happening in the US from the outside, you're looking at an institution not being, or other institutions not being able to hold as well as follow through on commitments that have been made on the world stage. You know, so those are things I think that the that the world kind of looks uh, at towards the US for. And just connecting to the other panelists, I'd also say that there is a tendency, given the demographic of people who run things in the United States, a very strong hegemonic tendency, right? And I think what, what we need is more folks from the pipeline to get up there, to get into these positions of leadership and break that tendency of hegemonic leadership and meet people and meet people and states from other parts of the world where they are, instead of looking at them from a porch. If I can build on that, just uh, because as you were saying that, a, a question was already formulating in my mind that I'll address to actually the entire panel, but starting with that question of, of, of hegemony, which is um, when we've often talked off the record with staffers and people who go to Washington, a sense that you come in and you may say, we need to pay more attention to Latin America. We need to pay more attention to what's happening in sub-Saharan Africa. We need to pay more attention to what's happening in Southeast Asia. We need to pay more attention to certain functional issues. And yet, they get to Washington and there's a sense, that's all very well and good, but this is the default position. And that is still largely transatlantic, 
largely hard security in some ways. So is it just simply a matter of more people coming, or is it a matter of changing? And and I wanted to also draw to a podcast we did earlier this year with Christina Luntz, uh, talking about feminist foreign policy, where, as she said, it's not just it's not a question of just simply looking at the policy outcomes. It's that different people bring different experiences and therefore bring different questions to the table. That is, they look at something, at, you know, starting with women, but for all of these different communities, is that they may just look at the same set of 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 realities, but come up with very different questions about starting points. So something about that, is there still within the U.S. foreign policy establishment uh, a set of default positions to which people are converted or are expected to adhere to in order to be, quote unquote, taken seriously, right? If you're going to be seen as a serious person on foreign policy, here's the set of issues or perspectives you're expected to have. And how does that change over time? Yeah. Okay. So uh, let me start off uh, on this. So I think you're right in terms of this sense of a default sort of foreign policy uh, objectives. And I think it's a question of priorities, right? Uh, it seems to me, at least from having done a fair amount of historical archival work as well, uh, the United States' default position has been to be in some form of competition with another geopolitical power for the last 70 years. Right, um, and so these geopolitical powers might change, they might come and go, and for a little bit in the early 90s, it was a real existential crisis because what do you do? The Soviet Union's collapsed, you know? And so, but then China comes along and you know, all is well, the United States can reorient itself and find itself in a strategic competition with another you know, great emerging power or emerging great power, and I think, Kind of building off what you said, Nick, I think is the question of priorities is, of course, priorities are shaped by the constituents, right? Priorities are shaped by the people who are in the, in the decision-making chairs. And so as that demographic starts to change, priorities will start to change, right? So maybe we'll stop thinking about geopolitical competition as being the only priority, and maybe start thinking about social and economic uh, indicators or world development indexes as being priorities. You know, and That's the number one thing that maybe the United States is concerned about. Geopolitical competition in the Indo-Pacific, maybe that'll come second one day. I'm not terribly optimistic about that happening, but it's a thought. It's generational. So exactly. that's something we were talking about earlier exactly. as well. And I think, um, so building for, from your question, I, um, especially about, about uh, feminist um, interventions into international relations, uh, you also make me think of um, a, a previous discussion that I, I was having about, about Asian studies and doing Asian studies, for example, in, in minority serving institutions and, and what is the role, for example, that, that minority serving institutions could contribute to, to a discipline that is very much that has its origins in Cold War logics, right? For example, and 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 how do we, how could we rethink maybe or expand or or reorient this? And part of the answer is is the perspectives of the people who are coming in. So if we are going to, um, you know, I, I, we were talking earlier about um, pipeline approaches, so these these grassroots approaches, but also if there was like a, a top down, for example, like policy push towards towards opening up ideas and discussions about about who makes foreign policy and, and what issues emerge. So in particular, for example, thinking about Asian studies, something that emerged for us in, in that discussion was that um, the idea of, of thinking about geopolitical hege um, powers and hegemonies wasn't very um, significant, right? So most um, people of Asian descent think of themselves as part of a larger diaspora. For example, and so thinking diasporically, so thinking about, for example, um, um, the knowledge production that results from from Southeast Asian Americans who are based in the U.S. who think about about um, U.S. history uh, in 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 regards to wars in Southeast Asia, for example, and what kinds of knowledge would would emerge from that? What kind of relationships and what kind of what kinds of of um, policy changes, for example, might we be able to um, incorporate and evaluate and, and place interest to? And this is, again, where, where I'm, I'm bringing my, my humanities flag, right? So, so um, 
I, I very much, I enjoy reading charts and I enjoy doing critical data studies, but also this is one form of knowledge, a very important um, creation of knowledge, but also um, the, the, my, the people who are minorities in, 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 in these, um, who, who come out in terms of minority positions, lesser positions, are usually always the same, right? They're people who don't have access to political or economic power. And, and these narratives we will find often are in cultural production, are in literature, are in, are in media, in, in, including popular media and social media. So what would it mean then, um, for example, to take, to take these forms of cultural production seriously as we do, um, as we do studies about, about even hegemonic um, issues in foreign affairs and also what, what can come up um, right. yeah, from these inquiries? Yeah, yeah and, and you know, I'm gonna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it back a little bit because I really, you know, when we take a look at public opinion, at least in those constituencies, yes, there's a generational element to it, but not the generational elements, not nearly as great, particularly among Latinos and African Americans than it is among whites. Do, whites. Um, so as we right, diversify, which is, is to some extent adding that um, level of voice to power structures, you know, the preferences are still in, you know, Partly economic, adding some human human uh, um, or civil rights and, and, and human affairs type of elements, but when it comes down to it, right, part of the drive for say African Americans or Latinos to be a bit more moderate on a number of policies, including sporting tariffs and and you know pushes against China, um, it's really based on, in large part on economic interests, and that's partly right, you know, you know framed within economic inequality here in the United States, but in terms of fundamentally shifting uh, policy orientations to something outside of a U.S. self in, or a U.S. interest based, I'm not sure, I'm real hopeful that that's actually going to happen. Um, I, I want to um, mention something and then we're going to go to you, the audience. So now that I said that, think of a question. Um, and we're going to have a microphone being, you know, so raise your hand and the mic will come to you so so we get your voice on audio. Um, but I want to say, you mentioned generational change. You mentioned that it, it's crossed the divide. So let's stop just focusing on Democrat and Republican. Let's stop being binary. I hate binary. Let's stop being binary. Words matter. Um, Millennial Action Project. Check it out if you don't know it. We had Layla Zaidan on our podcast. She works with millennial and Gen Z candidates for office, cross the divide, instead focusing on issues that matter to different groups um, and, and really focusing on the generational change of local, local, state, not just congressional, but local and state um, officials, you know, creating that network. So if you are interested in that policy area and in, in local state politics, um, she also works on federal level, but Millennial Action Project is a really um, a great organization that I think spans what we're talking about and who they are trying to shift the narrative. Um, so, so let me shift the narrative to you guys. What, what questions might you have for our illustrious speakers? Um, don't be shy. Uh, we want to hear from you. Okay, I'm going to try to formulate this on the fly. Um, so with with we had you guys had discussed BRICS uh, specifically at one point, um, and I know with China or at least with Xi not going to BRICS this year, um, due to you know I guess it would the, uh, more powerful BRICS sometimes could be viewed as like a lowering of Xi's power at least in China globally, or uh, within China and and globally. Um, how? With that, with that competition between India and China, um, uh, how how can the U.S. Uh, what what in what way should the U.S. look towards uh, trying to grab more influence in the global South with? Uh, Although BRICS strengthening, uh, it creates divides within BRICS. Does that make sense? 
thanks for that question. Uh, since I mentioned BRICS, I'm going to try and take that question. Um, I think it's interesting to think about BRICS with Xi in it being as this counter position, uh, in a counter position to China. Uh, I don't think that's necessarily the case. I think the expansion of BRICS, which you're seeing right now, uh, part of that is a part of a broader narrative that uh, China has been uh, sort of talking about for a while now, which is creating this alternative world order. The Asian Development Bank is a part of that uh, story. The AIIB is a part of that. Uh, the the uh, Belt and Road Initiative is also a part of that. Um, but I think one thing that the United States needs to keep in mind when it comes to this particular issue is that it shouldn't be trying to get influence in the global south, right? It should be trying to help partners in the global south uh, be independent in terms of energy independence, in terms of infrastructural uh, independence, uh, because a lot of the investments that you see from uh, China in Africa, for example, are all invest are in for infrastructure investment projects, right? Uh, if you look at the role of China in Sri Lanka, for example, where it's been building up these ports um, at you know, and then eventually taking over certain ports for a hundred year lease or something of that sort. Likewise, in Goada or in Pakistan, the thing is. There are other ways in which the United States and other countries which are sort of aligned uh, towards checking China, those countries could get together and try and bail out some of these countries when they are in need, right? When it comes to the particular India-China conflict, uh, I think the United States has a huge potential here, right, to be able to, one, wean away India from dependence on Russian imports, especially arms, especially oil. Um, and then, of course, build this coalition where you know you might actually have a greater amount of geopolitical influence in the global south, especially in, in the Indo-Pacific, in the Indian Ocean region, right, with India. But that means being more mindful of the kinds of interactions that you're having and being more mindful of the kinds of groups that you're creating. And here I'm thinking of AUKUS, right, mm -hmm. which very clearly led to countries like India and other countries in Southeast Asia to say, well, you're not going to have nuclear-powered submarines roaming about uh, the Indian Ocean, and you've cut this deal with the Australians. Where do we stand in this? Right? So are we being alienated here? Is there a special relationship, and do we come secondary? Right? So those are things that you need to be thinking about as you're thinking of a holistic approach towards trying to counter China. Thanks. Thank you. Hi. Um, speaking of things that other countries should expect out of the United States, uh, should expect out of the United States, um, the very loose policy and guns in the United States is affecting our global South in the continent. You know, with the iron flow of guns going into uh, Central and South America. Besides the pipeline of having a diverse group of people going into foreign policy in the United States. Have you thought about different and perhaps more immediate solutions to this? Specifically guns that are um, arming drug cartels and gangs in Central and South America. You know, and I think this gets to the heart of where domestic politics and polarization are going to be a major blockade to some policies, right? It's uh, and it flows in a couple of ways. One, we have gridlock, right, which we might see, or some of us might see, in terms of gun control and 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 stopping that flow, but also internally dealing with the the supply and flow side. Um, 
but it also you know, is problematic for signaling, right? And so as other countries are trying to figure out what we're going to do, which is an important part of our international system and our, our relations, um, they're not necessarily sure too, because we have these very polarized positions, particularly on gun control, at least within, at least by the parties, right? If you look overall, there's a bit more balance. Um, but I will also say that within the notion of diverse preferences in the United States, um, there's a lot of variation within groups uh, in terms of gun ownership, Second Amendment support, um, and it's not clear that that's actually, you know, as we diversify those policy decisions, it's not clear that we actually will get a more support for gun control and internal right, uh, regulation um, as we diversify. That's just, you know, that's part of it, but that we just can't get away from some of that polarization. Um, I don't have a direct answer for, for what to do with the flow of guns. But one thing that I feel your, your question makes me think about and gestures towards, um, especially in relation to foreign policy and international affairs, is the issue of like borders and, and mobility. Um, so there's often an anxiety, for example, of like porous borders and, and like um, certain groups of people and COVID getting through, right? And, and, and you're, I feel like it's important to also bring attention to to what is mobile. Mobile, like capital, is um, mobile. Um, I, certain ideas are mobile. Cultural products, weapons, and guns are mobile. And and I feel like you know that's maybe an, an area um, and a focus that that we could look at as well. What does it mean? Um, what is created at borders? Um, what kinds of spaces are borders? And then what gets through? Hello, uh, my question is for Tatiana. Um, earlier you said that uh, foreign polish, policy or foreign government should be, not foreign, I apologize, international government should be state government and local government as well. I think that you were referring to like unity among those, but could you elaborate on that please? Um, thank you so much for the question and excuse me for not being clear on what I meant. Um, so I think when we were in class today, you know, uh, we got, uh, some answers that said that, um, the federal government responsible for foreign policy and that happens over there in Washington. Thanks. And what we're trying to say and why we're here, uh, speaking with you is actually you decide foreign policy, uh, and that local leaders are engaged in foreign policy making and state leaders are engaged in foreign policy making. And it is about how we define and look at the word foreign policy. And, you know, I, I have beef with the word foreign because foreign means other separate, you know, something I don't want to touch or understand when actually, you know, we are all connected, you know, by our digital landscape that gives us free information flows, um, by if you're an American citizen, being able to travel more freely than certain other citizenships, right? Like there's many types of connections we have. We can go through the list, but in particular, what is happening more and more is that governments, state and local governments are creating ties because they recognize that they can create policies in the international space. So yes, if you traditionally think foreign policy is about war, right? <laughs> um, then yes. Okay. But foreign policy is also about trade, right? And so we just came from Texas A&M a couple weeks ago where they are really concerned about trade, uh, trade at the border, you know, the lines at the border, what, what happens because there's so much product going back and forth, legal product going back and forth, um, you know, and so trade, that's, that, so state representatives are going to meet with governments, right? Governors are going to meet with governments. Um, I'm from New York City. Um, our our uh, representative from Queens, um, AOC uh, by name, uh, by shortened name, um, took a whole delegation, a delegation of house reps to Latin America to four different countries because our constituents wanted her to, right? New York City is a very diverse city and the constituents, the diaspora said, hey, you need to create and make sure we have links, um, cultural links, uh, trade links, right? You know, we all expect, oh my God, we just had the best 
lunch today. We had we had the best Mexican lunch today, right? Food, food goes across borders. You know, where do you get some stuff? We also bought some Russian coffee uh, at your right. But think about where things come from, right? Trade, huge, right? And that's an opportunity at state and and local level for us to to think about foreign policy. Um, in Europe, I'm going to give one last example, and then we'll go to the next question because I know we're ending soon. But there's a bunch of cities that are getting together, um, Warsaw, Budapest, Prague, the mayors are getting together because they realize their pockets of, um, I'll say independent thinking in an otherwise autocratically moving national tendencies. <laughs> I don't know if I massage that enough, but 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 they're meeting as units, cities, so cities, mayors meeting um, to to discuss foreign policy and interconnections and linkages. Um, and uh, last one, okay, last one. I like to give examples. Once I start, you can't stop me. Last one, um, when and and I know that you know, supporting Ukraine is an issue, whether or not you do it. But at a local level, you have these links being created from local communities buying um, ambulances, buying um, food supplies, buying medical supplies, you know, local towns and cities in the U.S., and then sending them directly through contacts to Ukraine. So it was people-to-people connections. So never mind state, local, it was people-to-people connections. So, you know, and I think this is all made possible because of the world that we live in today and the interconnections. I've never spoken into a mic before, so please be patient. Um, So you touched up I apologize, I don't know your name, but you touched- My name is Nabok Dams. Thank you. <laughs> um, you touched up really quickly about how, like, kind of, I say, like, the priorities of the issues, and especially with so many different diversities, like you say, and that's your very big point, is, like, diversity will be one of the solutions in order to, like, kind of help fix a lot of the issues. With all the diversity- which, how would you prioritize or how would you, with all the issues, like how would you be able to pick like, let's fix this first or fix that. And, you know, especially everybody's so passionate about their own issue and whatever they're specialized in. So I just kind of want to see your kind of answer on that because you guys talk about it a lot. So, yeah. Well, I mean, my, it, I'll take a initial crack at it. I think one way that, you might actually have reprioritization when you have a diverse room is that there's something called groupthink, right? Like we think of things individually, but if the if the five of us get into a room and think as a group, pretty soon as we converse, we might come to a conclusion. These are the top three things that we think about as being the most important. Now, how might that happen? That, you know, something might be number one on Tatiana's list and something might be number three on Nick's list and something might be number five on Stephanie's list and it might be number two on my list. And so if we, there are many ways in which groups operate. We might just rank each of the things that we are interested in and see where we land with, with, with well, once we put those ranks together, right? So that's kind of an initial rank voting system, if you will. But there are other things to think about in terms of, we don't always personally know what are the stakes uh, of every each issue uh, or thing that's happening in the world, right? I might know something about my part of the world. I might know something very deeply about one particular issue. And everybody on in this table, everybody in this room has certain issues that they know better than the other person. When you get into a room and you actually hash it out and talk about it, you might have a automatic reprioritization. It's about being exposed to those views. It's about being exposed to different sensibilities, different priorities and different issues which might then bring a collective together so that's how i think diversity is probably going to change but yeah Yeah, just real quick so in that case then if let's say for that example like five people and then you vote or whatever so in a sense that there's there's still not enough like balance and there's still a potential for a hegemon to develop because of that. So I guess like my question is, how do you prevent that from happening and have everybody feel equally satisfied without feeling like you have to vote or one has to, you know, kind of, um, what's the word, compromise themselves? I love the logistical question. So I'll, I'll, I'll take a crack at this in the sense that um, 
building from from Deepak's example, right? So so even if like I I feel like given given the interrelatedness of of these issues. So even if, for example, we um, we decide that like an issue maybe most that we need to address, like right now, there's an urgency to to thinking about environmental issues. Uh, um, that's an issue that would also have effects on on labor. That would affect, for example, displaced refugee populations. That has effects on on diasporas as well. So, so f first of all, focusing on on one issue, focusing on resources, for example, on one issue, doesn't mean that that other issues don't get addressed as well, given given this interrelatedness. And I think one of the keys then is whose voices you center. So, so centering marginalized, vulnerable voices, having a clear vision, not just towards, towards um, um, representation, but a clear vision towards social transformation and social justice would sort of contribute towards a, a um, actionable policies that that have the potential so here i'm building from from kambahi river collective right if you build from from the the point of view of people who are multiply marginalized right so whose lives are in the intersections then the the knowledges and the policies that grow from that have possibilities of of contributing to social change in various issues and areas Right. And, and I think in terms of those ultimate decisions, I mean, you're going to have disagreements and some folks will be happier than others. Uh, but at the same time, making sure that there's a voice at the table and a strong voice to, if not recenter those discussions, at least to inform those discussions so others can make that conscious decision of, you know, what are the pros and cons and the benefits? Because the way it works now and often in case with a hegemonic kind of orientation is there's not even consideration. Um, and so I'm not, I'm not quite as hopeful that we can recenter everything, but I'm certainly not hopeful that we'll come to a consensus. Uh, but I think as, as we reframe narratives, then bringing more folks to the table and then we, then we build coalitions, right? And you reach out to others with similar interests, uh, and you move forward towards your goals, uh, through that kind of group based coalition. Uh, one last one, one last one. We, we will we will be here if you want to just chat with Yeah, we yeah. Right. I can't pick you guys up pick one. He's right next to Matt. Uh hello. Uh, so recently I saw um that the Army War College published a study about the Russian and Ukrainian war and basically how the amount of people being lost due to casualties and the amount of people needed to be reconstituted. Uh, the thought for large, say large scale combat operations with the U S uh, might need to move, or uh, basically the armed forces might need to move towards, uh, an all voluntary force towards partial conscri conscription. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, this encapsulates, oh, you know, war is the ultimate doorstep issue, right? When you are asked not just simply to pay more or suffer privation, but you are asked to kill and possibly die in the service uh, of, your, of your country. Um, and this, I think, article was meant, you know, it was a series of academics, not an official position. It's, it's, it's academic inquiry, but it's designed to get people thinking. War is not just going to be push buttons and drones and a video game approach. Um, are we prepared as a society for the human cost? Uh, are we prepared to make the argument to people about why sons, daughters, husbands, wives, and others might be asked to make this sacrifice and not to say, well, technology will solve it for us or it's not really going to be too many people and so... Uh, we can just afford to do it. In one of the classes we talked about this, that one of the things you as uh, students uh, are going to be facing is there needs to be a real conversation in this country about the war power. Uh, we've let that kind of lag for many decades. I'm just saying, well, the president can kind of make a judgment call. And, and we don't really go to war anymore. We haven't been at war since World War II, uh, legally, in a legal sense. Um, we have interventions and police actions and, and other things, but we don't fight wars. Not even what Russia is doing. Russia says it's a special military op. They're not at war. They're doing a special military operation. But the end result is, um, what's the argument? 
What, what are you going, if you're going to make that, how do you conceptualize the interests and whose interests do you center? Who's going to be asked to fight the war? If you're going to do conscription, right, because the Civil War, conscription was there unless you could pay your $300 or buy a substitute. So conscription was viewed very differently by <laughs> different classes in the Union based on whether or not you'd actually be called to fight. And is that going to be something we would see in the 21st century? Because we've gotten very used to the all-volunteer force as one that, well, I'm not going to be asked to do this. They volunteered. They knew what they were getting into. But it gets back to this foreign policy is not something that happens over there. And that article, I think, is meant as a wake-up call. And I hope it gets people thinking about what it means uh, to ask people to do that. And again, that it's not something abstract to you because looking around the room and knowing <laughs> a number of you are selective service registered, um, that this isn't just an abstract issue, but one you should be thinking about. And again, it should be informing how you vote and that you should vote, and you need to be uh, thinking about these issues. So, Tatiana, do you want Amazing. to Amazing. Thank you, Denver MSU. We hope you've enjoyed this special two-part uh, doorstep podcast, and we certainly welcome your feedback. Uh, we certainly also, for those of you who might be interested in having the doorstep come to your campus or area, please drop us a line and we'll see if we can work you into our schedule as we continue our listening and conversation tour uh, around the country. I've been so excited to do this, tour, Nick. Uh, we started off in Houston. Uh, I do want to mention at uh, Texas A&M, the Bush School of Government welcomed us. Um, we started this off also last year at Marymount Manhattan College. Um, and it continues, as you said, it continues for Global Ethics Day on October 18th. And we invite all of you to please join us. Uh, look at our website, look at our socials for information. We're gonna have live events here in New York City. And you and I, Nick, we're gonna be at Ohio State University um, talking at, to, this, at, to the same issues and finding out what your concerns are. Please join us. <laughs>